Okay, so uh, good afternoon here. I'm really happy as always to see the teams uh, engaging and today looks like particularly vigorous discussions uh, from a lot of core issues from what I could tell from the discussion in here. And I was happy to see you know good attendance at both teams. That's great. It uh, will really help your teams along. Um, I always hesitate to break those discussions, but as I noted today during tutorial time, there's gonna be plenty of time for you to talk further right after class. Uh, today, I wanted to, to speak about a topic that in some sense really continues the thread that we talked about last time. Um, remember, what did we cover last time in class? Again, with an R. Risk, risk. risk yeah, risk, risk management. And um, you know, big picture here, if you don't confront risks, they will confront you. Um, they will, if you don't aggressively attack them, they'll attack you. Uh, and there were a couple ways we, we identified of sort of managing that or, or lessening your vulnerability to risk. And I noted that it's that ability to protect yourself against risk, to make yourself less vulnerable to it by proactive action that really allows you to succeed and get high return. Um, and two of the big ways we talked about involved specific strategies for lessening your exposure to risk. We have this notion of exposure that combined probability of its occurrence with severity if it occurs, right? And there was a multiplication up here, you may remember. And, um, what were the two strategies? And, and one began with a C, you know, two words, and one with an M. Anyone remember? Contingency yeah, contingency planning mitigation. What's the difference between them? Contingency planning, how does it differ from mitigation? A plan that you do if this risk materializes, where mitigation is some upfront work to reduce the risk. Yeah, sorry. To, to, Cut it off or to lessen its impact on you if, if it actually occurs. Uh, so those would be uh, contingency planning and, and mitigation compared with each other. And both are super valuable. Um, we talked about you know, different situations when each might be more valuable. If you have something that's gonna take a long time to deal with it, you know, dealing with it only when it materializes is a problem because you don't have time to, to respond. Today, we're gonna to be talking what is in essence a mitigation strategy of a particular sort. It's a mitigation strategy involving of a technical sort. So it's not, you know, ferreting out conflicts between team members, as important as those are. It's not an issue with your development process like agile development, where you're constantly talking back with the stakeholder to make sure you're in sync which is a kind of process adjustment to lower your risk, like risk of requirements, misunderstanding and so on. Um, this is a technical strategy. And it's, it's based on something I talked about in my last slide last time, um, which was the fact that designing for the testability of your system, investing in a system that is more testable that can be tested easily uh, really lowers your vulnerability. Uh, why does that lower your vulnerability? Can anyone say? What, like, what is, what is making your system more testable make it less likely to have risks associated with it? Does making it more testable eliminate the bugs directly? No, but it makes it what? Yeah. Uh, easier to find the bugs. Easier to find the bugs. Your name again? Zach. Zach. Yeah, thanks. Um, so makes it a lot easier to find the bugs and find them early, find them often early, and thereby clear them out sooner. One of the biggest dangers is, like from a management perspective, that you think the system is sailing along just fine, but there's actually lots of bugs there. 
And sometimes you can be mistaken because like devs can pump out code. And if you're using like lines of code produced, you could think you're doing great. And if you're not doing much testing, you can fool yourself for a certain amount of time. But at some point, it comes time to pay the pipe, as they say. Um, you know, and those things will materialize. The sooner you can find those bugs, the better. What, why is that? Why is it that it's better to find the issue sooner, the bug sooner? Less rework required. Less rework required, because you've built less on them, right? Like, if you, if you have a logical bug in your system, not all bugs are like you type a plus instead of a times or something like that. Generally, it's based on a misunderstanding about how the system works or failure to handle a certain case. And if you start building on that, the things you build on it are kind of on quicksand. I mean, they, they, if, if you go and change that thing on which they're based, you may have to change them as well because they're not handling this case. They're not handling this extra issue. So, you know, finding them early is really important to avoid rework. I count them, I think we uh, said. Um, it's also really helpful to give the project managers a sense of like where we're at and, and you know, to what degree we really have the luxury of rolling out a bunch more features, to what degree we should be investing like in this version and cleaning it up, maybe doing refactoring. Right. Um, have you folks discussed in 370 or 270 the idea of refactoring? Is that thing you're familiar with? What does refactoring mean? Anyone? Yeah, Zach. Um, it basically means taking something that you've already written and then uh, essentially rewriting it to be cleaner or better. Yeah, exactly. Or it, well put. Um, it means taking something you've already written, key, rewriting or reworking it to improve some aspect of its kind of non-functional qualities. It's, it's quality, it's uh, reliability, it's clarity, it's transparency, it's portability. Things that are not about the features it offers. You're not expanding the feature set. You're just making it right you're putting it to place in a more robust way okay um you're putting it to place in a in a way that's higher you could say in general higher quality um it delivers more value even though the features are not changing they're not changing the functionality you're you're investing in in uh its value in the code base and and you know, refactoring is something that sometimes you discover as a need because there are bugs, there are code smells, there are bugs. So, so um, discovering problems early is, is really important. So we're going to be talking about investments in testability as a form of mitigation strategy. Okay. So let's let's sort of dive into this, and uh, we'll. See some of the components that this involves. Uh, some of this may be new to you. Others may be things you've seen before, but maybe you have sort of forgotten uh, or 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 not uh, brought together in your mind. Okay. Um, so the issue is, look, if you're putting together reasonably complex systems like you are, the system for capturing plate waste information, the system for missing children, you know, systems like this. Call them programs, but these days it's often systems. I mean, there, there may be some server side component and a you know component on the phone, and they have to play together nicely. Often they have a large amount of what I'd call internal state. There's a, a current situation of what's been captured. The, the current situation is rather complex. And and the issue is if you're trying to test that, um it's often you have really limited access to that. You're trying to test that. The system's in a in a good situation. There's no inconsistencies. Uh, it's working properly. Um, it's not taking too long in certain areas. It's uh, consistent on um, what it thinks over here and over here about the situation. The problem is that really gaining confidence that it's working well is is complex because 
if you just probe it through the GUI, through what users use, often it's really hard to tell like what's that internal situation behind it, and is it is it consistent? Um, you're kind of trying to view it through a straw, for example. Um, and it can be really difficult to determine, therefore, the cause for errors. Like if there's an error and it blows up on you, you get a stack overflow error on, you know, reported on a web application. Or you have a application not responding error on Android where the application freezes. You know, you want to know what caused this, right? Um, like what gave rise to this? And if all you have is going through the UI of the app before it got this application not responding error, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty hard to figure out like what's giving rise to this. Was it something you entered that screen or something three screens ago? Or maybe it was something else entirely, right? Um, that it lost the network connection and had nothing to do with what you're entering. So it's, it's hard to tell what's going on. Um, and here, uh, there's, there's often a particular challenge for testers because they're trying to recreate an error. Maybe they see it once and they want to recreate it, but they don't know what gave rise to it. Was it, again, what they entered? Or was it something else about the environment? So we're going to be talking about things like uh, hooks and logging and other mechanisms that improve testability, the ability to test your program. Um, they improve your ability to find these bugs and thereby you know, know about them and flush them, right? Um, or put in place workarounds. So when you deliver, even though it's still in there, you warn, you warn me that you know this is a known issue. And I'll view that as less serious than an unknown issue because you warned me about it. You say, don't, you know, this feature is not stable. Fine, I'll avoid that feature. But I'll know that you're aware of that. And, you know, users can sometimes also be guided. Um, okay, so here's some investments putting in place logging infrastructure. This is something I want from all of you. How, what that looks like is different for different platforms. You know, there's log4j on Java, there's log4js for JavaScript. There's various frameworks, but these aren't just logging frameworks. They're multi-level logging frameworks. What do I mean by multi-level logging? What do I mean by multi-level? Yeah. Um, Jeremy. Jeremy, yes. Uh, the information and logs at different levels, like if it's a uh, debug or an info or a trace. Exactly. Precisely. So you, you've outlined it well. And often there's something like five different levels. Um, so you get an error level, a warning level, you know, a uh, debug level, an info level, or what have you, that distinguish the severity. And the deal is you can maybe turn on logging at a given level for a given run to see. You know, like what's going on at that level, at the level of errors, the level of warnings, or really high level, or go into if you're getting close to reproducing the bug, maybe you turn it on close to the site of the issue, you turn on more detailed logging so you can see really what's going on in detail, right? Test harnesses and drivers, these are aimed at, I'm, I'm going to use these terms, driving the application programmatically. What I mean by that is, like your application shouldn't all be things that require a human user to press buttons, right? One way to avoid that is through GUI-based uh, testing environments. So these are things like, well, for web, it's things like Selenium, et cetera, right? But on, on smartphones, tablets, mobile devices, you can use frameworks that use the emulator, right? And they run emulators. And you have um, testing frameworks that work against the emulators. But the point is, you want to be able to kind of have a script that runs out of, against the application and undertakes its actions. But there's another way that often you can put in place, which is a scripted version of your system um, that calls it directly from code. Some systems that's not possible for. For the Oculus, the virtual reality system, some of you may have seen it before, like that, that's very hard to do. Um, it's it, the way in which the code is arranged is very difficult. I'd say for 
web applications or React Native applications, it's more difficult as well um, to drive it programmatically. I mean, to make it go through its steps without going through the UI. Um, and so it varies a little bit on the platform by platform basis. Um, but the idea is you want to be able to have a script that puts the application through its paces. And if you have to go through the UI, you know, that's something you can live with, but it's ideal if you can also call things directly at a lower level and have it do system tests without going through the UI. It's amongst other things, it's much faster often and can separate UI issues from non-UI. Um, there's this notion of a hook that we'll be talking about. A hook is basically a way to sort of peer into the state of the system and see if it's working correctly or not. And potentially to set something about that state. Crash reports are another thing. There's all these solutions out there. Um, Crash Linux, uh, Instabug are two of them, and there's others as well. That basically built their whole business model, their whole value that they deliver is around providing tools for developers to get really detailed information and contextual information about crashes or about problems. So they, they can get you delivered at a place that's really easy to access, like posted via HTTP to a database, um, reports on what's going on, let you query those reports, find bugs that match a certain, you know, a certain characteristic, et cetera. And uh, they can do so in ways that are often really handy and provide lots of good information on per platform basis that you'd want to know. Um, another idea is you know you have have configuration files that allow for driving the application declaratively based on what's in those those files. Um, this is less of a big issue these days, but allowing multiple instances of a client, I would say containerization is a big investment these days. It's not a, it's not a given. I, I said to you last Tuesday, right, um, that there are certain areas where containerization is really valuable, um, and there are certain areas which are kind of outside its effective range right now. Uh, if you have heavy GPU use, if you're using really specialized hardware. If you're using phone emulators, which already have a layer of kind of virtualization built in, doing like Docker based containerization is, is hard because you have this interference between the two levels of, of uh, virtualization one for the emulator and the other for, for Docker. Other things, uh, the use of a specification to basically say what this code does separate from the, the code itself so you can call them and, and predict or sorry call the code and expect certain things to be true and assert that it's true for example uh is a big investment comments and good naming are something that can help testability why does this help testability comments or good naming for code why does making the code transparent clear intention revealing why does that help in terms of testability, anyone? Yeah, Zach. Um, basically tells you exactly what the message is. Yeah. Yeah, so number one, it may head off bugs by the person who's using it knows very clearly what its expectations are. You know, th their expectations are aligned with what it does. But the second reason is um, the testers, if they're covering code that's really been written thoughtfully, in a literate way, as Donald Knuth says, the author of The Art of Programming and a legendary computer scientist, um, it, it's clear for them what the code is trying to do and they can reason about it more. It also helps peer review. Um, so in testing, um, good comments and good naming foster prevention of bugs and finding bugs more quickly because you can test it more effectively. You're not trying to how can you test something you don't know what it's supposed to do, or it's really unclear or what it expects, et cetera. Um, it also makes things more efficient by communicating across multiple parts. Um, the final thing I'll mention is stubs, mocks, fakes. These are these kind of um, fake versions of a portion of a system that return, they kind of serve as a placeholder for that part of the system. 
Now, why would you do that? Well, as a temporary placeholder, so you can build up things that depend on this without this being written yet. That's that's important. But another reason is so you can test things separately. You don't have to test the whole hairball at once. You can test A separate from B and C that it depends on. So if you have A depending here on, on you know, B and C, right? Um, you mock this out. You create a mock of it, a mock of it, and you can test A separately than B and C. You don't have to test all three together. And that allows you to localize where the problem is. Like maybe the problem is actually in C. And when you test A against a mock of C, the problem disappears. And then that might let you focus on C. Um, mocking can also help you even after, well, after C is written by allowing this sort of mocking strategy. Before C is written, it allows you to develop A and get some sense that it's going to work well with C. Okay. You can also, in C, check how it's being used by A and make sure it's being used correctly as it seems, as we'll see. In other words, to make sure it's being called as reasonable arguments, make sure it's being called at the right time instead of function that should only be called once is only called once, that sort of thing. Um, so stubs, mocks, and fakes are commonly used in, in, um, in testing uh, here. Okay, so let's talk about test hooks. Um, further. So test hooks provide this way of, of um, allowing for the testing of the hook. Um, and there's really two big, big things we achieve with this that I want to emphasize. Number one, you understand what's the current situation in the application. You understand if it's working, if it's not working, is this correct? Is that data structure consistent? Does it have nulls in it when it shouldn't? All those sort of good things. Um, are there duplicates in this database that there shouldn't be? Um, you know, uh, is this linked list look like it's uh, in order that we expect? Is this array sorted properly? These are things where, you know, if you're going through the UI, it's really hard to check, but if you have a hook, you can run and, and check. Is that, is that correct? Is that array sorted like it should be? Um, the second thing is you can actually modify the state to accomplish some test scores. So maybe in your test, you want to see if your application performs well when the data, when the network is congested or when there's been a network disconnection. And so through a test hook, you might tell it basically set it in a state where it's as if it doesn't have a network connection. You see if it still operates properly. Sometimes test hooks are used for this. Often these require just small bits of code to sort of provide this functionality. And it's the sort of code that might be checked with an insertion. Um, and uh, these really often improve the testability. And uh, this is third party integration. So integration by others as well. Okay, um, so here's some test hooks. This will just give you some idea because the term is kind of um, kind of okay, right? Um, there's hooks for inspecting the internal state, like asking what's going on here. Is this correct? What's in the database right now? Um, how many items are there uh, listed now in this array that are non non empty or what have you? Um, some mechanisms to sort of process event notifications so that you can, for example, report when something happens. Maybe it's a key press, maybe it's a, um, a connection and disconnection from a database or what have you. So you put in place an event hammer that's basically going to say, hey, this important thing happened, that important thing happened, and you can log it and, and report where you are in that process. Uh, Diagnostic routines. These would basically be, you know, hey, are things sane in this regard, that regard? So they check invariance, integrity, consistency. I listed some earlier, right? Like, uh, does the database have any nulls in it? Um, are there repeat entries within this within this uh, hash table, for example? Um, are any of the 
entries in this array negative. Um, these would sort of test uh, test the consistency there. And then there are these methods for programmatically driving the effort. Um, and uh, I had alluded to this. Okay, so some more example test hooks. Enabling and disabling logging. Why not log all the time? Well, you tell me, why not log all the time? Why would you log only part of the time? Yeah, me. There's just a uh, bunch yeah so sometimes you feel like you're looking for a needle in a haystack so to speak i mean you have a ton of information point out put out and maybe your interest in this particular run is just in a small part of it so that's one of them. one one component another component is um you know sometimes you're interested in any pro and sometimes you're not Sometimes your goal in running this thing is not to get, you know, a blow by blow account of what's going on. It's to just um, go through some user functionality. Maybe you're giving a demo to a client. And you don't want it to be logging. It also can have serious performance impact um, to log. And the, the general choice here is to log very selectively. You want to be sometimes even surgical in your log, like choose very precisely when and how much to log. So you only log, you know, this component when A calls C in a small region of this code or something like that. That's what you're going to log. Or maybe you want to only log high level information, like what was said earlier. You only want to log, you know, as Jeremy said, High level things like A called C and A called B, and you don't want to report anything what's going on. Maybe you only want to report I connected to this database, I executed a query, I got back results, I disconnected. That's it. Sometimes you want to do things that are much finer grained than that, like I'm iterating through each item in this database or what. Um, okay. Uh, you know, browsing internal data structures uh, through, you know, a custom language or a custom UI. Occasionally, you'll see that. Um, uh, check in on this is uh, intermediate state of an algorithm. If you have a really sophisticated algorithm um, that's quite long, like knowing what's going on in the mean in the middle of it can be quite useful, and it can be quite hard unless you have a way of kind of peering into it, looking inside, and you know, trying to put in place a way of doing that. How would you do that? Suppose you had a really gnarly, long, long algorithm. What's one way you might, a very basic way, you might try to make this a little bit more testable? Suppose you have a really long algorithm in a function. What, what's something that could help? Something along the lines of what Zach said. It's a, it's a refactoring of sorts that's going to help. Yeah, so um, break it up into multiple functions. Why does that help? What does that help? It actually helps a lot of things. And what give me give me at least one or two. Generic. Uh so generic? Yeah. So so help me understand that a little bit more. Yes. Yes, you can reuse them in a lot of places. So it may break out portions of this that are reusable, right? So you take this part out into a function, you take this part out into a function, and this part out. And maybe you find they're actually not only used here, they're used by many, many other places in the code, you know, uh, because they have common, they check common conditions, they they undertake certain functionality. So, so that's exactly right. It's more generic. You've, you've brought it up in terms of accessibility. So that's an excellent find. What's another thing that will help testability here about bringing these things up? Like using multiple functions to have, like, help us to like, uh, debug the issue more precisely. So that we can test particular functionality where the issue is. Yeah, so it allows us to test each of these separately, right? 
Yeah. Like each of them might have a precondition and post condition, right? That we can check and we can write tests not only against this whole hairball, but against these things separately. We could write unit tests, right? We could write mechanisms that check this out. What's another thing that could be done here? Well, you could log each of these, right? You could you could put in place log. You could profile each of these. What, anyone? Not, what are you about profile here? Anyone? You test how much time it's taken, how much time it's spending in this. If if all you have is this, all you know is like it's spending a lot of time in this function. But here you actually know in detail like where it's spending its time. You know, it's spending it within these. You can mock them out. And have them have it a mock of it put in place that you call it returns a fixed value or it returns a random value or something. And that allows you some greater ease in testing things that depend on it or, or things. So taking it out of here um, enhances code readability, clarity, transparency, reusability, testability among multiple fronts. It is a Good thing and chart. So it's a good thing for testability side alone. Log them, you know, have contracts by which you can test them and, and have tests put into place for them, right? Um, all those reasons, it can be very valuable. Um, okay, uh, you know, finding. Some other example test tests, uh, custom command languages, some, some larger applications have their own sort of scripting language to basically issue commands within the system programmatically. In other words, from code instead of from the user. Finding out the current connection state. If you have an application that's like client server, it's connected from a client to a server. Less common these days, but you know, what's the connection state? Is it is it connected? Is it connected with the database correctly right now? Um, request the amount of data you've sent and the amount of data that's been received back, right? Uh, or how much has been stored? It's the state of the cache. Report back some statistics on database tables. Report the database locks taken out. There's lots of different components here. Now, for your particular systems, these will be different. Um, and systems that are based on on um, mobile devices, for example, will tend to be somewhat different from a web app, will tend to be different from a desktop app. But these ideas can be adapted. And if students are interested, like the testing team or the dev team, come talk with me and we can brainstorm about ways that you can make your code more testable for your particular application. Uh, in general, you can test invariance, make sure that, you know, a given child at risk uh, is only associated with a single unique, you know, login, uh, or there's never a duplicated entry for the same meal for the same, same meal type uh, for, for, you know, a kid in the, in the, um, uh, the case of the uh, application for plate waste or whatever, whatever it is, each meal is only disposed of once or something like that. Um, there's only one entry for original weight for a given container and a given child and only one entry for the final weight, not two. Um, and then, you know, some test points to, to set these things. Okay. Um, so, you know, in some applications, you can deliberately cause uh, problems. Now, this is obviously for the case of testing. Like, you, you put the application through its a stress test. I don't know if you, you folks have heard about stress testing. You know about the idea of stress testing or load testing? Does that come up in any of your classes? Anyone want to guess what's a stress test? You might put an application for it. Quite important, actually, on mobile devices. Uh, maybe checking the performance of an application like how it's affecting the mobile uh, RAM, GPU, and other processing things. Okay, so so that is important. Like, how much footprint does it take memory wise? How much 
How much is it slowing down the application? Is it a bottleneck? Sorry, slowing down the, the phone. Is it a real bottleneck in terms of the phone in general? That's pretty important. But what's another, what's another thing you might want to do for, for your application itself besides seeing how it imposes on the system? You want to kind of flip that around and test how, how it behaves if the system otherwise is really really congested or slow or non-responsive. So, you know, examples of this, like you're, so you're creating an app, great. You're creating a, a mobile device app. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. But what I'd say is that depends on a lot of other things outside the app for its, for its situation. What things outside the app might it depend on? Yeah, Zach. Uh, so you might have an like external API. Oh, okay, yeah. So there might be an external API, and it needs to call off to the local database in Android, or it needs to call off to connect to the network. It needs to request OS features to create worker processes or service service workers or what have you. So, so that can definitely happen, and that's a dependency on the rest of the system. So that's one way it's coupled to the rest of the system. What are some system resources outside the application by itself that it may depend on? And it might be affected by if those are not working well. What, what are some other things? What can an application depend on outside of itself? The availability of the, the internet, the network, right? Online, offline, this is a big issue with, with, with these applications. Um, you know, you, you want to be prepared for the fact that, you know, your app needs to function quite well, unless it's a very special situation and you get authorization from your stakeholder, you should be prepared for it to lose a network connection at some point, maybe at an inconvenient point. Right when it's updating the message in the ball. And this is a whole area of computer science uh, that's designed to build around building robust applications despite these things. And so we have notions of transaction. How many people do you think in three? Oh man, they've changed the numbers over the years. Um, it's, it's a course which, uh, how many have taken a, a a course where databases were discussed in quite some detail. Zach, good. Uh, and let me, Jeremy. Jeremy. Uh, back there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, um, did, did the issue of transactionality come up there? What's the notion of transactionality? Or give me, give me some bit of flavor. Of it. Well, yeah, so. Um, so basically it allows you to kind of like start and stop and go back. Okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so often when we're undertaking an action, um, we have a couple things we want to do, you know, and maybe, I mean, let's think about it. Classic example, right? Uh, you you, um, uh, you want to purchase something online. You want to enter your credit card information. It charges your credit card and it arranges that item to be sent to you. Maybe it's on Amazon. Or um, that's a transaction. That's something that needs to occur together, right? Like you're not going to be a happy camper if it charges your card and it doesn't arrange for it to be sent to you. And, you know, it's not an excuse that Amazon says, well, we lost the network connection, right? Like either it needs to do both or neither. Amazon won't be a happy camper if they ship it to you without your card being charged. You may be a happy camper, but they won't be. So both things need to happen together or not at all. And transactions allow you to sort of bundle these things and say, hey, look, I want to I want to undertake this. If anything goes wrong along the way, roll the whole thing back, and that's what you're referring to, Zach. It's like you you start doing the work, 
But with the recognition that if something still goes wrong, the whole thing gets undone. And this work I did earlier won't be counted against me. It won't be left in place. It'll be undone. It'll be rolled back. It'll be as if I never started it, right? And you know, when, when uh, we're updating something, we don't want it to half update and be in a corrupted half updated state. We don't want the message in the bottle to be half updated. We want it to either be fully updated or not at all. We don't want it to have half a message, half the old message, half the new one or something like that. Um, and so we need it to be robust in the context of, of something like a network disconnection. Um, another thing is like phones can run out of memory. On a phone, your application can be evicted. If I go and I switch to another application and start doing things, your application like, can be kicked out of memory. In many cases, it's to be kicked out of memory. And you know, you need to be aware of that. You can't be in the middle of something and have it die in a state that's going to be corrupted from then on. You're not going to be able to restart it because it was halfway through some important operation. You need it to be able to handle this, right? Um, or memory is, is full. It's out of memory or a file is corrupted. You need to be able to make sure your application will fail gracefully, will not cause a permanent problem with this app, right? I mean, look, you have to be adults as software developers. The world doesn't always go as you want it to be, right? Um, I have to be adults and realize things sometimes go wrong and we have to clean up after ourselves. If things go wrong, we have to, we have to make our program able to handle them. In an undergrad computer science, you're generally trying to solve problems and you're assuming, you know, for your solution, the things are in place for you to solve it. And that's great, but the real world is an ugly place and things sometimes don't work the resources aren't available and your code needs to be able to work safely, even in those cases. Um, so sometimes you cause your application of errors to make sure it works properly under these conditions. Make sure that, you know, if the message in the bottle is being updated and there's a network disconnection along the way, that it still works properly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You, you got to invest in your system so that it works robustly, even when there are failures on things you can't control. Um, okay. So uh, logging, we talked about multi-level logging. I don't think I need to show you much on log file side. You know, there's a bunch of basics that are important, right? Typically timestamps, some message, some location potentially, or some machine if you're in a multi-machine context. Typically, some priority level for the logging. Um, and the priority level will often delineate one of several levels, and then you can enable or disable logging at different levels. You can enable it only for the most important messages, the highest level messages, or less, less important messages. And a lot of the time, the way logging packages work is they'll really optimize it so that if you call something when the logging at that level has gone on, it will be very little overhead. They'll just, you know, uh, put it aside. Uh, it won't, it won't affect your port, port, port. Um, Okay, automated crash reports. These are real, really advantageous. Um, particularly if you're gonna have crashes in your system. Um, you know, that's when the system gives up the ghost. It's when it dies. It's when it's no longer running. And you want support code that in that event will swoop in and, and report it. We talked about stress testing. And stress testing is something you folks will probably want to do, particularly about your server-side architecture. So stress tests generally involve testing your system, for example, a web system, uh, against when resources are short. Maybe it's a uh, slow network connection. Maybe it's memory is short. Maybe it's disk space is short. Um, you're, you're testing it to see how well it operates. 
load testing involves testing it against lots and lots of hits. So for, think about a web system. Um, it's one of the ironies in life uh, for those build web services, web applications, that when you build a web application, you want it to be popular, right? You want it to be really popular, but if it's very popular, it's gonna be under stress. Why do I say that it's gonna be under stress? What, what happens? when a web application is very popular. Yeah, you get server overload. And that's kind of a, an overall term for it. Uh, what particular things might, might happen? A little bit more, a little bit one level down from that in description. What things might happen? You get server overload. You get lots of people accessing it at the same time. If there's things that need to be served up for a given user. Um, there's gonna need to be a lot of stuff retrieved from the database and maybe via network. The networks may get congested. The, the, the disks are gonna be very busy that store the information. The database is gonna be busy up, updating, right? Um, and often the time to serve a given user gets longer and longer because it takes longer for the disk to deliver the day. It takes longer for the network to deliver the day. The user is going to be waiting longer. So more users are going to be waiting for a longer amount of time. And there's a risk of what? If you have waited, users waiting for a long, long amount of time, what can happen? A server begins with T, ends with T. Timeout, right? It's a server timeout. You get the database connection doesn't come through in time. It doesn't get the information. And, and so web applications often need to be tested really seriously because they need to shine. They need to shine. You need them to shine when they're popular. And that means you really to scale at very large levels uh, to bursts of traffic. And that's really hard to get any confidence that it's going to scale. You have to test it with a high load. You have to artificially create a high load. So you have scripts running tons and tons and tons of requests against it, as if there are tons of users. And you make sure it's working well. So in those cases, for web applications, for phone applications and other devices, um, you know, this issue of crash reports is really important because when a crash occurs, under load or under stress, it may be hard to reproduce. And you want to get that crash to produce as much information as possible, allow you to zero in on what happened. And so crash reporting software allows you to do that. Um, often it's left in user shipping code. In contrast to something like assertions, which might be taken out, crash reports are left in. Um, and, you know, often there's there may be some questions asked by the user uh, whether you're willing to comment on what, what was going on, but often it occurs automated information. Things like what version of the software. This is important, right? Because maybe they're running an old version of the software. Um, maybe they're running on an old phone. Um, and maybe it's no longer an issue because this is just you know, an old phone, old version of the software, it's outside of your concerns. Um, it could be third party software is running. It might report that the line and the file number, the method, the, estimate, the nature of the error, our user ID, you know, um, and information, you know, about uh, so, someone about, you know, who, uh, who is associated with, if there's a user, if it's a web app, for example. Um, and generally, you know, this is packaged up, this sort of information, and maybe posted via uh, HTTP. Um, modern systems will often tie this in with your issue tracking. So if you have Jira, you have Redmine, or, or um, you know, issues, uh, GitHub issues, the, these sort of systems can, can insert it there as an issue. Uh, and you can link it in. And, you know, you can, uh, here have you know 
querying after the fact about what happened and, and looking for these things, um, looking for these problems. Okay, um, so watch, uh, watching the time here, um, uh, right. Um, I think I covered this for mocking. Um, we talked about how it plays a role in unit testing. You want to test A without testing B and C. Um, and also, if you want to do integration testing of these, um, you might want to drive it uh, essentially from, um, from A, or you want to do unit testing of A and B separately from C, you have a mock of C, and you have that work with those two rather than a full C. So, so integration testing, you're building up combinations of these things. You want to be choosy about what you include. Um, uh, also for the testing UI, um, you might want to be able to test sub, sub areas of these. Um, right. Um, there are some tests where we actually use them against, uh, against some mocks. Um, uh, for example, uh, you may have mocking that logs behavior. So maybe the mocking uh, turns up the whole functionality of C, but on the way it interposes, uh, interposes code that will do logging. So when you call it, it will automatically log. And then it will pass it on. It's just a wrapper. It'll pass it on. And it takes care of that. So so this sort of uh, interposing is something some frameworks allow that allows you to sort of intercept the request, report some information like log it, um, maybe re record what information was passed and, and what information is returned in the other way, and then do the call. Um, right. Um, okay. So just to give you a, a sense of these systems, um, I'm going to show you an example from one of the oldest such systems. It's still around. It's still very popular in the Java world, which is called JMOC. Um, and the idea here is this system is used in Java. It's used to create, to automatically create instance of a mock uh, object. So maybe of a class C. And using JMOC, it can automatically create a mock of it that looks just like a C. So it matches the interface that a C matches. You've seen object oriented programming, right? All of you have taken two steps. So you know about this notion of polymorphism. All right. What, what's polymorphism? Can anyone tell me? What does polymorphism involve? What does it mean for this that Java is, supports polymorphism? Well, poly means what in general? Polyhedra, polygonal, polytechnic. What do, what do these things mean? What does poly mean? Yeah, multiple or many. Many multiple. Um, and what does morphic mean? Morph. It morphs into that. To, yeah, it's a shape. It, 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 it's changing shape. Um, so polymorphism means many, comes in many forms. So it's changing form it might be a good, good way to put it. And the idea here is that if we have a class diagram, suddenly this is a class diagram. We have C and B as subclasses of A or C and B as interfaces that, that extend this interface. What's the thing with polymorphism? I can pass around the C as if it were a what? Okay. An A, right? I can pass around a student as if they were a, a reference to a student as if it was a reference to a person. I can pass around a reference to a Orange is if it were a reference to a fruit. 
Um, this is a subtype of this. It it adheres to the same contracts as this. Everything you can do on an A, you can do on a C, and it, you should count on for an A, you should be able to count on for a C, but maybe C has extra functionality beyond that. So this, this is an example of polymorphism. And in Java, you can use that polymorphism to, to say, you know, this, this object implements an interface, this object implements an interface, therefore they can be passed around uh, as an instance of this interface. And mocking uses that ability, basically mock out an object. It creates a fake version of it that can be passed around as if it's that object. Um, and it allows you to set expectations for this object. So for example, for this object, you could say, see, there's these various methods, which are invariably called foo, bar, bas, and what's the fourth one? You want to know? Can't miss it. It's that. Um, okay, there, there are your methods. And they take different numbers of arguments to return different things. And with the mocking framework, you could basically tell it, you know, foo, should take all things that are not negative. And the pointer that passed to foo should always be non null. Uh, or you might say bar takes an array that's sorted. Or you might say that baz always returns a non zero value or something like that. Um, or, or only takes a non zero value. Uh, so here you can tell it some expectations. For this object, you can tell it what to do when it's called to log or to to return a random value, return a fixed value, what have you, return the, the value that was passed to it. You can do all this without writing code. That's the thing. JMOC allows you to say, do this. And it will say, yes, sir. It'll or yes, ma'am. It'll it'll go off and do it. Um, and you can record, you know, what's what number of times should this be called? Now that's all nice, but why would you do that? Like, why would you say this can only be called with these things or with a non null or with an array that's sorted or, you know, this can only uh, only be invoked one time or zero or one time? Why, why would you do that? What's the use of that? Yeah, that. Okay, good. And to confirm that it is being provided with proper input by the areas of the program that use it, right? And so by mocking this out, suddenly, automatically, you are able to test the things that use this, use it properly, at least in these regards, right? You can test that it's being used correctly that it's being passed the right things by the code that's using it. and that's really advantageous if you could then check those things and then call the actual code for c that also might be nice but maybe c doesn't even exist yet maybe it's to be written still and you can still do this so in short mocking allows you to truly really get a head start in development it allows you to, to put in place tests that are more effective it allows you to do this in ways that are that are pretty um, minimal in terms of code. Okay, here's an example of using the JMOD. So the basic deal here is, for example, you can check that expectations uh, are met, and and you can confirm, for example, in this case, that you know the subscribers received the message that was set. For example, um, that was sent to them. Uh, and this will allow you to essentially check okay, are these expectations met? This is actually a published subscribe system, which maybe a, have you folks seen published subscribe? Set? Maybe you would have seen in your classes as a pattern. No? Oh, okay. Um, so, published subscribe is a very common software pattern that basically allows you to have something, some, some work going on, some process taking place, 
and you can get subscribers to it. They'll be notified via messages when new information is fed. Maybe, maybe I'm publishing new weather reports. Whenever I get them, I'll send them out to various things to consume or various apps or whatever. Maybe it will be instead of sending out information about you know the um, uh, the notifications from uh, a system that's measuring temperature, or maybe I'm maybe I'm sending out notifications involving disconnection and reconnection to the network to apps that need to know about that. Publish subscribe is a common model, and what this is checking essentially is the publish subscribe is working. But these are the sort of expectations that a JMOC mock object can, can in fact say. It could say, for example, this argument is equal to F. So Fu could say, when I am called, make sure that this is the case. Or this argument is the same as that one, or the same object as that one. Um, you know, that um, this argument holds a value, a value of, of this type that's not null. Um, or it's not that this is the case, or all of these things are the case. Um, and you can say what it should return back to the client. It returns X or it returns Y, it returns a certain value, or it returns uh, uh, an iterator. Uh, each time it's called, it returns a different one, for example, from the iterator, or it throws an exception or what have you. The point is, all of this is declared. It's not. You're not writing complex code against this. You're just saying, let it be that C works this way for these uh, functions. And that allows you more effectively test it. It allows you to uh, put it in place in a lightweight way, have this mocked out. If you have a real version of it, you put that in place in other times. But when you want to, you can have uh, an interface that tests when it's being called. This is yet another version of investing and testability. So we've covered a bunch here today, um, but big picture here, what we're talking about is designing for testability. We're talking about investing as a matter of risk mitigation in, in your systems to ensure that, uh, that you have protection against bugs, that when you find bugs, you find them early, and uh, you, you do so in an active way. This is about being proactive in another way. If you log, you'll be more likely to find things that are problematic, and when they find them, you'll track them down sooner. Uh, if you have cleaner code, it can help you avoid problems in the first place, and if they occur, find them sooner. If you have crash reports, it allows you to zero in to know that they occur, even though they're on users around campus or around the world on their phones, you know, that it occurred, where it occurred, and you can zero in on it. Putting in place hooks, this requires developers. Developers in the room, you can be thinking about hooks. What hooks could you put into place that your test team will be able to test more effectively, right? Um, you should be able, you should be thinking about this. Um, how can you make your application more transparent for testing? Because that's what allows you to find those bugs earlier instead of them remaining unknown and, and only popping up at inconvenient times, like when Hassan is using the application. And by putting in place these basic mechanisms, also things like assertions and specifications, that's how you can build up a system that's more likely to deliver value. And it's less likely to be buffeted out by a last minute bug that you know comes up five minutes before you turn it in. So invest in testability. It's a matter of risk management. It's a mitigation strategy that allows you to avoid a broad class of risks that can otherwise wipe your pocket. Okay. So testability, I want to see these sort of mechanisms through your projects through the term. Okay, um, you don't have to have every single one, but I'd like to see a bunch of them used quite extensively in the projects. And you know, you could we can have a dialogue why some of the others might not have been feasible. Things like logging, assertions, specifications, good comments and naming. These are things you really got to have. Okay, 
Okay, that's all for today. You now have tutorial time uh, that you can use as you see fit for your product. Okay, and remember next week we do have ID one too. Right? Thank you.